made. And this will the information you'll see this morning is out of chapter three. Okay, what are we doing here? Hang on. There we go. Okay, I just got to learn how to play the game here. All right, this morning we're going to review the reasons for failure in construction being profitable versus being competitive, and then we're going to get to calculating your markup. And I'm going to throw in this stuff up front because too often people see the math of a markup and then they want to come back with, a, well, nobody can charge that in this town. We're too competitive here, that kind of stuff. All right, so what we're going to do is, is I'm going to give you some background of why the markup is what it is and why once you set it, you can't cut your markup on any job, regardless of the size. Anyway, so I'll give you a little background as we go along and you'll be able to see this and judge for yourself what you want to do. Reasons for failure in construction. There are six major reasons in why people go out of this business. Three, actually there's three major reasons and three minor reasons. <clears throat> Reason number one and the largest one that takes out over 90% of all contractors is not charging enough for the work or service they provide. That will, that will take out over 90% of all the people in this business. Um, I can give you statistics all day long on that, but essentially what happens is when people start a construction business, the first year, one out of three won't make it to the end of the first year, and two out of four will not make it to the end of the second year. So we've got a pretty high fa failure rate in this business. Second reason that construction companies go out of this business is lack of use or improper use of change work orders. Change work orders should be outlined, written, signed, and paid up front before any work is done. Following that rule, you very seldom will have trouble with change work orders, but it is a rule that's seldom followed in this business. And uh, most of the time, uh, uh, you know, in, I would guess probably one in three jobs, we end up having fights between owners and contractors over change work orders that were left to the very end. And that simply doesn't work. Number three reason, failure to use or improper use of contracts. It's amazing that the um, contractors will learn how to build a building and do a great job of it, but they won't learn how to write a good contract. We still get people calling us complaining because the customer won't pay, and when I ask to see the documentation for the job, they don't even have a contract written. It still goes on. And I'm not talking small job, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars jobs. I'm talking jobs in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are started and worked on and no paperwork. Okay, those are the top three that'll take out somewhere between ninety and ninety-six percent of all the construction companies that go out of this business. All right, now we have four, uh, three more. Too many employees for work produced. Okay, that's the fourth reason that causes problems. The fifth reason is improper payment schedule on contracts, and both of those, four and five, uh, will contribute heavily to lack of cash flow through your company. If you're having cash flow problems, chances are it's going to need to be number one, four, or five that will cause those problems. Okay, and then lack, and number six, lack of profitable sales. Um, you know, you can set your, you can set your sales goals, you can set your markup, do everything you want, and everything can be perfect, except if you don't make enough sales, you're going to go out of business because there's no money to pay the bills. So, if you combine all those things here, you're going to account for probably 98% plus of all the reasons construction companies go out of this business. <clears throat> now, there is an underlying uh, reason that contractors uh, have financial problems, and it boils down to be, uh, the profitability of a company versus the company trying to be competitive. Right? And the high rate of failure in construction is a result of contractors trying to be competitive, just like it says on the screen there. All right. Being competitive is optional. Being profitable is not. And, you know, there's no yaw but here. You're either, you're either making money or you don't. And if you don't, you're going to be out of business. And it usually when companies are losing money, it takes anywhere from three to nine months for them to fade out and go away. And we've been watching this now since I started studying why construction companies go out of business in 1969. And invariably, these are the issues that come up most often. Okay. Profitable versus competitive 
it's the difference between market-based pricing and cost-based pricing. We're going to talk a little bit about those two and why you need to get your arms around those two. And this will tell you or show you why you may be having some financial problems in your business. Market-based pricing <clears throat> is based on the sale of mass-produced goods, clothing, food, vehicles, books, etc. Um, um, lawyers, doctors, dentists, those are all market-based pricing uh, businesses. Okay, their percent of profit is based on their total sales where they can go in and have a call, a, what we call a lost leader sale um, <clears throat> or cut their prices on some particular phase of their business or product that they're selling. And this in turn generates more sales because more people are coming in to buy in more of the product or other additional products that have their, their correct markup on it. And so what happens is that uh, when you have a loss leader sale, and I'm going to demonstrate one here in just a minute, um, the company will, uh, not always, but, but for the most part, they have loss leader sales because they want to generate more profits. So let's take a look here at a good example. This would be of soups. Um, <clears throat> Campbell Soup Company makes a product called Beam with Bacon Soup. It's probably one of their top selling soups that they have. They sell, you know, literally worldwide. Campbell Soup sells the bean with bacon soup to the supermarkets where you go shopping or the you know the, the grocery stores for about a dollar a can, and they in turn mark it up 1.2 to 1.3, which means that they're selling it for a dollar twenty to a dollar thirty. Okay, that's pretty much uh, if you go uh, nationwide and check the prices, that's pretty uh, pretty common, and and we know this because we you know we do our seminars virtually all over the United States, and I always check and. You know, what's a can of soup cost? And they'll, most people can tell us. Okay, so we have a grocery store manager that's profits are down a little bit. And he says, well, we need to get our profits up. So he calls, contacts the IT department, and they put on the Internet on their website that they're going to have a soup. They're going to have a sale on Campbell Soup Friday noon to Sunday noon, and you can buy up to 12 cans for a dollar a can, which means they're selling it for what they buy it for. And so this will generate a bunch of sales into the store. People will come in specifically to pick up the bean with bacon soup. And of course, when they're in there, they don't just pick up the bean with bacon soup. They pick up a whole bunch of other stuff. And when they come out of the, out of the get to the, the checkout line, you know, they've got a whole bunch of art, um, items in their grocery cart. And when they, when everything is totaled up and they're paid for, the profitability from the store goes up because the people have bought a bunch of other items that are still at full markup and it more and offsets the lost leader sale of the one dollar can for Campbell soup. Okay. And there's a number of other uh, things you've all seen. Uh, vehicle sales are the same thing when they advertise one particular, say a Ford F-150 pickup, uh, Ford Motor Company, there may be a dozen dealers in your area and they will advertise uh, this, this vehicle for sale. And some people come in and they like the Ford F-150 and they buy it. And there's people that don't like it. And they'll walk around the parking lot and they'll pick out something else and they'll buy that. But when, when they buy the other vehicles at, don't, that are not on discount, they make more money on it. And, of course, then the dealership makes more money. And that'll hold true for grocery, uh, like I said, grocery stores and car dealerships. It'll also hold, hold true for clothing stores, uh, virtually any kind of store you can think of. Um, and that and that's how they generate more sales for this for their company now contractors sometimes believe that that you know they can discount their work and that will attract more work to them and you see this often in um, advertising you know will uh, I seen uh, something from Anderson window here the other day um, and you purchase Anderson windows and we'll give the installation free that's a loss leader sale okay because they're making enough on the windows that more than offsets the cost of the labor that they supposedly are giving away, although I'd like to see their, their books on that to confirm that. But many contractors buy into this idea that they are uh, also in a market-based business. Now, when they, uh, when people that, that, that believe they're in a market-based business, this is some of the things that are typical of those companies. Uh, you talk to them and they're always fussing and worrying about other companies' prices. Okay. Uh, they always adjusting their prices downward to be competitive. 
is saying or thinking we must be competitive. And see, this is all about price on these things. They use the word free in advertising. That's a big mistake. Free only attracts people who are looking for something for nothing. Okay, so if you've got free, you know, duct tape over it, sand it off your vehicles, whatever you got, but don't use the word free in your advertising because you're attracting the wrong kind of people. Okay, they ignore the financial needs of their own company, and even worse, they ignore the financial needs of their employees. Okay, this is one area that a lot of contractors make a mistake. You cannot ignore the financial needs of their employees. Okay, they rationalize cost plus your T&M contracts. You should never do cost plus and T&M only on small service work type contracts. Okay, feedback from clients on these companies that think this way uh, often, oh, their price is too high. And you know, it's, it's a vicious circle that they get into with between the contractor and the, and the owner or building owner, whatever it is. And also you see people and they get, they buy into this myth of 10% overhead and 10% profit, which simply doesn't work in construction. Okay, so that's market-based pricing, okay? Now, let's talk about cost-based pricing. There are only two businesses out there that fall under the category of cost-based pricing that we've been able to identify. You and construction are one. The second one is sit-down restaurants. That's the only two businesses we've been able to identify that are cost-based pricing. Now, their pricing is based on the sale of individual product or service. And this, again, applies to all construction-related company. Your percentage of profit you make is going to be based on the individual sale. You know, my dad, uh, my grandfather had a business from 1915 to 1932. My dad had a business from about 1948 to 1972. Uh, I've had businesses... Um, uh, um, you know, this all the stuff you're seeing here is a direct result of the years and years and years of research that we've done on this. You can't have, you can't base your profitability on multiple sales. This Gates job has to stand on its own two feet. That's one of the things my father used to say. Each job's got to stand alone. Okay. So what that means is that your sales price cannot be lowered on any given job. Once you set your markup, that's it. You can't cut your price on jobs. Okay. If you do cut your price on jobs, and we're going to talk about this more a little bit later on, if you do cut your price on jobs, what's going to happen in most cases, you'll give away some, if not all the money you need for to cover your profitability for a job. And if you give away all your profit, you probably are going to be giving away some of the money you need to pay overhead. And then guess who gets to pay that out of their own pocket? Okay, and that's you. So this is one of the things that you've got to start you know, if you if you've been basing your your entire sales presentation on price, then you may start want to uh, uh, you may want to start take a look at this and see if we can't uh, get that turned around because pricing is not the way to go. Now, cost based pricing, the contractors that follow this line of thinking, they're aware of their competition, but they don't worry about them. Okay, they correctly calculate markup or gross margin, and they never adjust because of competition. They never use the word free in any advertising. They keep a good advertising program in place 365 days a year. They never cut their advertising budget. They maintain the highest pay scale for all employees. And why do they do that? Because that attracts the best employees to their company, who in turn get the jobs done quicker, with fewer callbacks, with less cost, and increases the profitability for the company, so they in turn can pay the employees the top dollar. It's a circle, and it works very well. Cost-based pricing contractors that understand this concept will only work on a fixed fee contract. They don't do cost plus, they don't do time and material, they give a firm price quotation up front, and the good ones can all get their estimates within 2% of the sales price of the job. They don't bill, they don't invoice, and they don't have receivables on any jobs other than those working. No billing, no invoicing means that you put it on your contract and tell your customers they must follow that payment schedule. Because in the U.S. or Canada, when you invoice, people think they have 30 days to pay the bill. You just did the work. Why are you waiting? Let's get paid. The minute you get done, you need to get paid. Okay. Good contractors know when to say no. They know when to walk away from a bad job or a bad customer or a combination of both. And they have a well-developed nose for money. By that I mean they ferret out the, the 
the type of jobs they can do where they make the most money. And two of them that I talk about in our are uh, making the numbers work in construction class, which we do all over the U.S. Uh, two of those things we talk about is doing work for uh, uh, house leveling, and and that is a very very lucrative uh, business. Not knocking the houses down. I'm talking about re-leveling a house in case a corner is dropped down or something, windows and doors sticking, that kind of stuff. You're fixing those things. That's you know your markup on that stuff is two plus, oftentimes three and four times the cost. Okay, and the other one is the assisted living complexes are desperately looking for people to do work for them, and it's amazing how many contractors just ignore those. Okay. But those are two things. That's what I'm talking about, having a nose for money, to be able to ferret out that type of business so you can, uh, uh, you know, make more money for the work you do. Let's talk about setting your profit and overhead expenses. Okay, so we're going to back into this markup thing now. We're, we're heading down that path. So that's a little bit about the, the cost versus um, market-based pricing. And, and now we're going to get into setting your profit and overhead percentages, okay? Your profitability for your company must be at least 8% net profit. That's for long-term companies, sustainability and growth. Two, three or 4% doesn't get it. You've got to be at 8% plus, preferably 10% or even higher. Uh, many of our coaching clients uh, end up in the 10 to 15% every year and that's where you need to be, okay? Now, why is this true? Here's what's going on. You notice up the left-hand side here, we have the percent of profits, minus four up to 10%. And across, across the screen here, we have the number of years you've been in business. And the first year in business, you're going to have some expenses like vehicles and tools and stuff like that. And if you make it, if you're one of the, if you're two of the three that make it through the first year, uh, you're going to have some expenses, and so your overall profitability is going to probably end up somewhere between 1 and 5%. That's typical uh, based on our studies over the years of, of contractors and, and uh, how they make, uh, how much money they make. And so let's just say the first year you're in business, you make 2% like we show right here, okay? And after the first year, we go in through the second year, and you keep up the hard work, and you end up with about 4% net profit. But right in here, a lot of contractors contact a disease. It's called the one-up. I'm going to go buy it right now. And what that means is they start buying new vehicles and new trailers and new this and new that, and their profits end up down here in the toilet. Okay. And so they wake up to this someplace in here, and they turn it around, and the next year they make good profits. And the next year something like 9-11 happens or a hurricane happens or an earthquake happens or something happens to get our customers to stop calling us, in which case, uh, again, the phone stops ringing. And uh, for those of you up in the Northeast, you know that when 9-11 happened, I know contractors up there that didn't have a phone call for four and five months. Okay, and that's gonna hurt your business. So you're gonna have this sawtooth effect until you get your profitability at 8%. And when you do that, you're gonna notice that the sawtooth thing goes away and everything kind of levels out. The main reason is you as the business owner can then focus on running a business rather than how to get the bills paid every other week or how to pay uh, make payroll every Friday, okay? Those worries distract you from the, your, you know, your uh, game plan of running your business. And when you at 8%, that's when this all levels out, just as you can see right here. So that should be your goal, and there's a lot more to it, and you can read about that um, uh, in some depth in the book Markup and Profit, The Contractor's Guide Revisited that we have. You can find that on our website at markupandprofit.com. Okay, so we've got the profit set now at 8%, and now let's talk about overhead expenses. Everyone in business has overhead, and I do mean everyone. Okay, if you work out of your home or have an office in your home, you have the same percentage of overhead as the guy is that, that uh, has uh, a business downtown on Main Street in a big storefront. Okay, the dollars are different, but the percentages are almost the same or should be. Okay, so everyone in business has overhead. So let's talk about now the biggest myth in construction. The biggest myth in construction. I'm going to ask you two questions here. Let's see if you can answer them. Question number one, as your volume or sales go up, your overhead expenses go which way, up or down? And the answer is, they go up. 
volume goes up, your overhead expenses go up. Now, question number two. As your volume goes up, your overhead percentage of total sales goes which way? And the answer is, <clears throat> it goes down. And the misunderstanding of this concept right here is what gets a whole bunch of contractors in trouble. Now, let me explain that to you how this works. You'll notice we have a graph here. On the left-hand side, we have the dollar volume built right up here. And put as many zeros behind this side over here on the left as you need to kind of balance up where you, uh, to uh, kind of real, uh, equate to where your company is. Across the bottom, you'll notice we have January, February, March, right on down. we got 12 months of the year. Starting in January, you have certain fixed overhead expenses, fixed overhead, meaning your salary. And by the way, let me let me get off here just a little bit. The company profits are not your salary in construction. Now, a lot of CPAs don't understand that, and they'll tell you that no, no, we don't we don't put your we don't put your uh, your salary on your P and L. That your 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 salary is your profit. Don't you believe that? And if they're telling you that, it's time for a new CPA because you are effectively undercharging for your work. Okay, that said, your fixed overhead is your salary right here. Your office, anybody working in your office, the thing you pay them, that goes right here. If you have vehicle payments, which you should not, but if you do, they will go under fixed overhead as well. Certain types of insurance are fixed overhead. And the list goes on and on. I, I, I would imagine there's 20 or 30 different items that could fall under that category right there. Now, <clears throat> at the start of each year, you start making sales. All right, that is represented by the red line you see right here. It says total volume produced. So as your as your year goes on and you collect more sales, you notice your red keeps going up, and your 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 red line may go off to the right, may go up a little sharper, whatever it is. But this represents the sales for your company. Now, when you sell more, as you sell more, you start generating what we call variable overhead expenses. Two good examples of variable overhead would be fuel for your vehicles, because the more you sell, the more driving you got to do, and your fuel expenses go up. That's that's what represents, that's, that's this area right in here. This is your variable overhead expense area. And another one would be job supervision. If you have individuals running your jobs, the more jobs you have, the more supervision you have, and the higher your variable overhead will be for the job supervision. So if you collect your overhead, your fixed and variable overhead, you it's represented by the blue line you'll see right here, going right across. Now, as your sales goes up, as the red line goes up, that means your blue line goes up at the same time. Your total overhead goes up like this. Now, you notice out here in August, September, October, it doesn't go out here and start curving down because your sales get more. It doesn't. It keeps right on going up. It does not go down. However, you'll notice also that the end of March, 1st of April, somewhere in there, if we check our fixed and variable overhead, our total for the two is about 64% of our sales at that point in the year. However, if we go over here now at the late November, early December, and check our fixed and variable overhead, you will see that it is about 35% of our total sales for the year. Now, as our sales goes up, our overhead expenses goes up, but our overhead as a percent of sales goes from 64 to 35%, and that means that the overhead goes down. And the lack of understanding of that, and, and, and that's why you hear contractors say, "Oh, my job was quite a bit. Uh, my job was quite a bit larger, so I was able to cut my markup because my overhead isn't as high." See, they they're, what they're missing is they're trying to take their percentage on on going down because of part of sales, but that's simply a function of a different angle of, of, of the amount. So, if you look right here. This line doesn't bend down, so you can't cut your markup on larger jobs. And I mentioned to you earlier that I would talk about that. There you go. So sales goes up, expenses go up, but an overhead percentage goes down. If you keep that in mind, that will stop you from ever cutting your, your sales price on the next job you go out and quote to a customer. And they say, oh, your price is too high. And you get, well, let me see what I can do. And you get busy and you're trying to figure out a way to cut your price. And that's where you get into trouble. How do you project your sales volume? 
So we're coming now, we're going to work on the markup. All right. Project your sales volume. You can do that from compiling your company history. And that is the hard way to do it. But it is possible if you've kept good records, you know how much you've sold in the past, and you kind of look at the economy today, and you can pretty well predict how much you're going to sell. There is a much easier way of predicting what you're going to sell for your company. And that is you set it based on your own personal financial requirements. If you've been in business less than five years, one to four years, if you'll take your personal, you, you calculate your personal financial needs at home, every dime you need at home, you calculate that. Then if you've been in business less than five years, you divide that amount by 0.08 or 8%. That will tell you how much you must, the company must sell, build, and collect so that it can afford to pay you the salary that you want. If you've been in business longer than five years, five, seven, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is, you can adjust your <clears throat> percentage, eight and a half, nine, nine and a half, ten. I would step it up every two or three years as you, as you can and as your company uh, sales allow it. You'll see that when you, you divide your income there at 0 0.10, you get a much higher income for the same volume work. Okay, let's take a look at how this works. So you set your income for your home right here. This is projected income for home. And again, if you've been in business a while, eight, nine or 10%, whatever it is. So let's say you want to make $120,000. All right, you've been in business four years. So that means we're going to start with 0.08. We, so we dive, divide 120,000 by 0.08. And that means the company must sell, build and collect a million five hundred thousand in sales uh, so that the company can afford to pay you that kind of salary. Now, if you're not, you don't have those kind of expenses, you say, I can get by in 60,000 and I've been in business eight years. Okay. And we're going to pay ourselves 10% of our sales. So we take 60,000 divided by 0 0.10, which is 10%. And that means the company must sell, build and collect 600,000 in sales to support your $60,000 habit. <coughs> that's the way it works. Okay. Real simple, but that's a good way to, that's a good way to do it. And that way you can keep on top of your numbers. Now, if you do a good job, of reviewing each year from between November 15th and December 31st. If you do a good job of reviewing the past year and making projections for the next year, you will find uh, using this formula here along with everything else in, in that uh, in that exercise, you'll find that you'll do very well. Now you can find uh, two papers that we've written, parts one and two, on year in review and next year's planning on our website. You go in there and go to the search feature and just type in uh, your end review and it'll come up and if you follow those two papers uh, you'll find that your business does much better because you it's a you know it's a you've got a game plan and you know exactly where you're going now you're not going to get it done in a week or two it takes about six weeks to, to do a good review of your company and planning for next year but the end result is that you, a lot of many of our coaching clients are call me in uh, September and October and tell me they've already hit their sales goals for the year so that's that's well worth the time all right, let's get to mark calculating our markup. That's where we're heading with all this. Now, assuming your overhead and your profit numbers are correct, and by the way, Karen Mitchell is coming up in a future webinar here. Karen is probably one of, if not the best, CPA that we found in the country for construction-related accounting. Okay, and Karen and I have been over virtually every number we've got in here, and she agrees exactly with our process, what we're doing here. So if you have a profit and loss statement, at, and, and we got to assume here that those numbers on your P&L are correct, all right? Then <clears throat> the way you calculate your markup is your total sales divided by your job cost or cost of goods sold equals your markup. Now, your markup times your job cost equals your sales price. You, those are just the exact same thing, okay? Markups are always calculated using job costs, where gross margins are always calcul calculated using sales price. But gross margins is another issue, so we won't get into that here. Okay, now <clears throat> we're going to take this a little bit slower because I tend to rip through this pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to slow it down. So let's assume you're doing a, say, a remodel job, or maybe you're a specialty contractor, whatever it is, and you're going to do an estimate for a small job. Your labor is calculated. Now, this is fully burden labor rate, by the way. This should be on your estimate. Uh, is 95.60. That's your labor rate for this for this particular job. Your materials are 57.05. Uh, 
your subcontractors are $4,384 and your other costs are $1,560 for a total of $21,209. That is our job cost or cost of goods sold, if you will. Now, we're going to assume for talking purposes here this morning, we're going to just grab 1.50 as a markup, which, by the way, is your minimum markup you should be using as a remodeling contractor. Now, 1.48, now 135, 1.20, 1.15, none of those. 1.50 is your minimum markup for remodeling. And I'll go into that in a bit, uh, why, that's, why that's true. Okay, so when we take our formula, markup times job cost equals sales price. We take our markup, 1.50 right here. We take our job cost of 21,209 right here. So we take 1.50 times 21,209 and we get a sales price now of 31,814. Now keeping in mind that a markup, that one represents your job cost, this number right up here, or these numbers right here, or in particular this number right here. That's the one. The 0 0.50 represents your overhead and profit. Now, if you've calculated your overhead correctly, you know exactly how much profit you want. There's no room to cut prices. Okay, so that should be fairly clear here now, okay? Um, okay, now let's go to, let's go to calculating our markup. How do we get that 1.50 figure right down here in the corner? Okay. Let's assume you've got a small company and you're doing $500,000 a year and your overhead is 25.33% or $126,650. And now normally a remodeling contractor, you're going to be, you know, 24, 25, 26% on the low end and it can get high as I've seen uh, overhead uh, expenses for remodeling come through at 51, 52%. So normally if you're somewhere between, I would say 25 or 26 low end, 31, 32, 33% high end, you should be right in that ballpark, you should be good. If you're outside that range, as long as you have a good reason for it, that's okay. But if you're overhead, if you're claiming your overhead is 15% is or 12% or something like that, you better look at it. Um, and a good, a good place to look would be in the markup and profit book, pages 28, 29, and 30. And we review uh, your overhead expenses for your company and the percentage they should be of your total sales in depth in there. We have some charts and graphs and things you can go in and look and kind of compare where you're at uh, to what's, what I would consider to be the industry normal. All right, so we have a profit of 8%. We talked about that earlier for $40,000. Now, how do we come up with a markup? Okay, we take our dollar volume sold built and collected as 500,000. We place it down here under volume. We divide that by our job cost. How do we get our job cost? We take our overhead expenses, which we've listed right here, and we take our profitability that we're projecting. We add the two and subtract it from our dollar volume sold, built, and collected, just like it says. Subtracts two and three from line one, and we get $333,350. Those are our job costs. That's the money we have to get our jobs built. Okay, so we take our volume of 500000 divided by our job cost at $333,350. It equals our markup, which is 1.4999, or always round up, 1.50. Okay, you always round up your markup, you never round it down. And I'm going to show you why. If you have 500000 in sales, right here, and your job costs are $333,350, that gives you your 1.4999 markup. All right, we're going to round that up to 1.5 as we should. Now, let's go back and take our job cost times our markup. And this time, we get, we get worrying and fussing about pricing, so we want to round our markup. Well, we'll round it down to 1.49 instead of up to 1.5. We'll round it down to 1.49 times our job cost, and we end up with a sales price for the year of all of our jobs at $496,692. Now, if we do what we should do, which is take all of our job cost times a rounded up markup, at 1.50, we get total sales of $500,025. Now look down here at what happens when you lower your markup to 1.49. You give away $3,333 or leave the money on the table, as is said. 
This is why you always round up. Now, if you got, if you wanted, if you don't want that three thousand three hundred thirty-three dollars, I'll raise my hand and volunteer. You can send it to me. I'd be glad to take it. I'm not a bit bashful about money. Okay. This is why even you're rounding up one ten thousandth of a point. All right, tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths, right there. One ten thousandth of a point, you round it up. It's nothing. It's minuscule. It's like that. But look at the difference it makes in your sales for the year. And your customer doesn't know. They have no way of knowing unless you tell them what you shouldn't do. Okay, let's keep going. What's the right markup for your company? All right, new home construction. The minimum market for new home construction, the survivability market for new home construction is your cost times 1.26. Now remember, I've been studying why construction companies go out of business since 1969, okay, and have been focused on the numbers in particular since 1980 in this business. And our research has shown over and over again that your minimum market for new home construction needs to be at 1.26. Okay, and it can range all the way up to 1.45 before it will have a decided effect on your sales. What's the average around the country? Based on information put out by the National Association of Home Builders and other groups that specialize in new home construction, the average contractor in America charges 1.15 times their cost, a full 11 points less than they should. Is there any doubt in your mind why construction companies fail? And believe me, the big guys have the same problem, okay? During the last recession of 2008, 2009, okay? We lost about 40% of the of the great big home builders that do 2,500 homes a year or more. They make the same mistakes the little guys do. You would think with licensed CPAs on their staff, they'd know better. They don't, okay? Let's go to specialty trades. Specialty trades being electrical, plumbing, roofing, siding, windows, doors, concrete, that kind of stuff. The minimum markup for a specialty contractor would want to be 1.35. I've seen specialty contractors use markups all the way up to 3.5. Okay, The average around the country, as best we can tell from our research, the average specialty contractor marks their stuff up 1.20, a full 15 points less than they should be. Let's talk about remodeling. And this will probably apply to most of the people here. Your minimum markup for your work. I'm not telling you what to mark up your work. I'm telling you what your minimum needs to be. Minimum markup for remodeling company across the country is 1.50 times your cost. We have coaching clients that mark up two, 2.5, three, 3.5, up to four times their cost and get it all day long. Okay. Now, what is the average markup across the nation for remodeling companies? This is from com this is from associations like NARI and some of the other people that focus on remodeling. The average around the nation is 1.25, a full 25 points less than they should be. And if you look in at these numbers, there's no doubt about why I said right up front, okay, that over 90% of all construction company failures is due to the company not charging enough for the work they do. There's your numbers right there that will prove that. Okay. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands this. Quite often in our two-day classes, guys will come up and say, Michael, this, the town I live in is way more competitive than anybody else. Okay, we can't charge those prices. And my standard response is, how in the hell do you know? You've never tried. Okay. These prices work across the nation. I've taken sales calls in all states all over the place and use the same markup. In fact, most of the time when I take a sales call for another company, I have, I add five points to their markup and go out and can sell it just as well as anybody else. Price is in the mind of our right up here. It's not out there with the customers. It's right up here. Okay. And if you let it get the best of you, you're going to end up selling your job short. Now, here's a little trick that you can use to make darn sure that you don't undercharge for your work. What most contractors do is they set their markup based on their smallest job and then try to lower it as the job gets larger. If you're smart, what you will do is you'll set your job, your markup based on your largest average job, whatever it is. Now, maybe you don't have 150, maybe your average job is 50,000. Whatever it is, you got to rework this graph right here to suit yourself. 
So if you set your mark up at 1.5 for 150,000, then on the jobs that are less than that, 100 to 150, you use a 1.55 markup. And jobs 75 to 100, you use 1.6. All the way down the line here, down to the jobs under 10,000, your markup should be times two. If you use those markups like that, you're gonna do okay. You're not gonna get rich, but you'll do okay and you'll keep your bills paid and you don't have any cash flow problems. That's the smart way to set your markup on your business. Now, where does your markup go in your clear estimates program? Notice right here, it goes right in there. A 1.5 markup will show up as 50, 50 and 50. Now, one more point here that we strongly recommend you use one markup across the board for everything. You don't use variable markups. A lot of contractors do that and they end up short at the end of the year. We have done studies with our coaching clients that when you use one markup across the board for everything throughout the whole year, you will make more money than another contractor working right across the street from you that goes out and uses variable markups. Like hell, on material, he'll use 1.5. And on labor, you'll go 1.6. And subcontractors, you use 1.2. People that use variable markups like that will never make the same money that a contractor will make if they use one markup across the board and never and never and doesn't change it. Okay, I got one more slide here on on the incorrect formula for markup. Now you can't put this in your program or maybe we could figure out a way to do it, I don't know. But this is a formula that's been hanging around now for several years and now the US government agencies are starting to pick this up and use it. So if you do work for any governmental agency, city, county, state, uh, parish or federal government, and they come at you with this formula right here, job cost plus overhead plus profit, hand it back to them and if you're smart, you'll walk away. Okay, this formula right here was, uh, uh, somebody figured this out way back when and it started out with some of the big big companies like Macy's and, and uh, you know, when they had contractors come in and do work for them, they said, well, this is how you're going to price your work and the contractors didn't think it through and they said, okay, fine, not a problem. Now, let me show you what happens when you use job cost plus overhead plus profit equals sales price as opposed to job cost times markup equals sales price. Let me show you what happens here. Using the same numbers we had above, 500,000, overhead at 25, all these numbers are the same numbers, I don't change the numbers. You take your job cost plus overhead. So here's your job cost, 21,209, plus 25.33% overhead, which is this number right here, 5372. Add those two together, and we have a subtotal of 26,581 plus profit. We take our subtotal of 26,581, add 8% profit, which is 2127, and we have a sales price then for the job at 28,708. Now, take this same job cost and plug it into our formula we gave you earlier, 21,209 times 1.5 markup gives us a sales price of 31,814. Look at the difference here, gang. $3,106 on that job right there. You're giving away, you're leaving it on the table. 9.76% less money on the exact same job. I've had guys say, oh, that's not that much. Oh yeah, let's take a look. That means if you drop your total sales for the year, 9.76%, that means you're now selling 451,200 instead of 500,000, which means you lose all of your $40,000 profit we've got listed right up here and 8,800 of the money you needed for overhead. Now remember earlier I said that if you give away some of your profit, you chances are you're gonna get away all your profit. If you give away all of your profit, you're also gonna give away some of the money you need to pay overhead. There is a classic example right there of exactly when that happens. Right there, you got it. Okay, so if you're taking notes, you'll see that stuff. Anytime anybody asks you, you do job cost plus overhead plus profit. I have even seen a couple of cases where architects have asked contractors to submit their quote bids using that formula. Just, you know, just tell them no. Here's my price and hand them one price. And how you get that price is none of their business. That's proprietary information. This business of transparency is just absolute suicide for a contractor. And if you haven't run into it yet, uh, you know, keep on with the transparency and get disclosing your numbers and you'll see what I mean. Okay, I want you to keep in mind 
Um, I'm not being mean or nasty here, but I've been at this 57 years in construction, and I've seen about every scheme and scam you can think of, of architects, engineers, building owners, homeowners, uh, governmental agencies, you name them, trying to scam contractors out of the money they're rightly, rightfully due for the work they do. Okay, and this is one of them, this formula right here is one of them right here. Okay, now a couple of quick things and then we'll go to questions and answers. We have our newsletter and our blog. Our newsletter comes out every Wednesday morning. You can sign up for the newsletter right here at markupandprofit.com. And on our website, we have over 900 plus articles uh, that you can go to and read, no charge, and help you with just about anything you can think of. It'll be in there. We've also got a relatively new forum that we started. It's called constructionbusinessownersgroup.com. And if you are a building, uh, uh, if you are a construction company owner, we would welcome you to that group. Uh, we encourage you to go and join. And let's see what else we got here. Um, oh, I mentioned to you, this is in the, here's another book right here. Profitable Sales, a Contractor's Guide. You may want to take a look at that. That will help you when you know what your markup is, and then you can go out and sell your jobs, and you know you're going to do very well financially. Okay, so with that, let's go to the questions. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, I haven't seen any questions that Devin was not able to get to yet, but if anyone has a question, feel free to ask it here in the chat on the right side of your screen. I do have a question, Michael. Um, sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so we talked about payment schedules kind of at the very beginning there. Do you have a suggestion on the number of payment schedules? What kind of retainer we should take up front? Um, you know, how many payments are typical sure. for a contract? Mm -hmm. You betcha. All right. If on short contracts, less than two weeks, you should have three, maybe four payments. You always get a down payment. You get a payment on the first Friday of a job. And then depending on the length of the job, you should have one more payment, maybe in the middle of the job and then one at the end of the job. One of the things you want to always do is make sure your final payment is never more than about two. And for real small jobs, it can be as high as 5% of the sales price of the job. But on any, any job over about 5,000 uh, bucks, it should be kept at 2% max, uh, max. And that's for your final payments. Now, as far as your rest of your jobs go, um, you know, the larger the job, the smaller the down payment, but I would in no case would I do less than 20%. 20% down, and then you want to get a payment at the first Friday of the job. Now remember, we used to, the payment schedule used to be one third, one third, one third, and that didn't work. And then the guy said, "Well, let's let's uh, get payment schedules one. You know, at the finish of framing and the finish of roofing, and we've got the floor covering done and we got the painting done. We'll get a payment after each one of those." And that found, they found out real quick that doesn't work either, because customers are always looking for reasons not to pay them. So they switched to, "Well, let's let's get our payments uh, at the milestones at the start or something." And again, now you're going to get the banks and everybody else that get involved in the finance, and they don't like that. So what it's evolved to, the smart contractors get a down payment, they get a payment on the first Friday of the job, and they get a payment every other Friday. Okay. Now, if you do that, which means that your payments are going to be smaller, but you, what you're going to find is it's going to eliminate a lot of the cash flow problems you may be having. Okay. Now, uh, now there's nothing wrong with that payment schedule. And uh, we have uh, contractors in California say, "Oh, we can only do a thousand dollars down, or or ten percent of the sales price, whichever is least." Well, that's true, but you can also get a job initialization fee. You can get a uh, material purchase fee. You can also get a payment on the first Friday of the job, so you can maintain that pretty well. As far as you change work orders and stuff like that, there's no rule in California, and I've got the documentation from the state. Uh, there's no rule that says you can't get paid for your uh, change work orders up front. A lot of contractors in California believe that's not true. Okay, they think, oh no, no, you got the state. No, the state has no ruling at all on on deposits for change work orders, so you can get paid. Okay, so basically, I hope that answers the question. And uh, you know, if you got a, a forty or fifty thousand dollar job, you get a down payment, progress payments. You probably got uh, what? I might. Term, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. 
Yeah, everything's everything's great, Michael. Yeah, okay. that, that completely answered the question. I appreciate it. Yeah, I kind of wondered a little bit. Uh, it worked a little better if I uh, if I had a graph I could put up and show you. I don't have one there, but it, yeah, there's that's it, it, you spread your payments out, make them smaller, and you'll find it eliminates a lot of the cash flow problems that a lot of contractors have. Okay, right. Yeah, we've got some questions coming in here. Let me take a look. Um, Shannon, we'll just kind of go in order here. Shannon, you can find the recording for referral marketing just by going to our blog, clearestimates.com, underneath the support tab, just clicking blog. Uh, interesting one here. So Dominic says, how do you get over a guilty feeling you have when you feel like your sales price is too high? Well, do you feel it? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> A guilty feeling. Oh, well, if you're not in business to make money, why in the hell are you in business? That's that would right. be my question. Okay, um, you know this. This is you've got to step back out of this emotional thing and stop and think about this. Are you feeling guilty when you go to the store and pay money to buy groceries for your family? Okay. They don't. They don't feel guilty about charging you for, you know, as an example for. Uh, and I'm an ice cream nut, but Dryer's ice cream is, you know, what five and a half or six dollars for, you know, for half a, or for a pint or not a pint but a quart. Hogan does ice cream is little pint things like that. They charge four or five dollars for. They don't feel guilty about charging you. You got bills right. to pay. Bills to pay, and and you got to get over this idea of feeling guilty. This is a this is where your your focus is more on price than on selling quality, value, and service. Here's here's another answer. How long you've been in, how long you've been in this business? How many years have you been training yourself to do the job you're going to do? Okay, isn't that worth something? Contractors want to just go. Oh, well, I just I've been in this business thirty years, and I can build anything. Yeah. That 30 years is more training and experience than most doctors have. Have you ever seen a doctor back away from their payment schedule? Okay. Yeah, and this kind of comes back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with Kyle Hunt in the sales process webinar is just being confident in your numbers. So if someone you know turns you down, there's going to be another homeowner or customer that's willing to take you on because you're you're confident in your numbers. Well. Yeah, this uh, uh, it, you know, there's there's an interesting question or a statement right there. Homeowner turn you down. Um, I want two out of every three homeowners to turn me down. I only want one in three. That's what I want. And then I know my pricing's right, my sales presentation's right, and I'm getting rid of the tire kickers and the troublemakers, which is that will be the two of the three will be a problem for me to deal with. I don't need it. You know, I can say this now. Most of your kids on this program can't, but I can say I'm coming up on 77. I don't need any more problems, especially with customers. Okay? If I customer, I take a customer, I want good customers. I'm going to charge them a fair price. If they want to pay it, great. If they don't, I'm I'm get on my horse and head back for the stable. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, interesting one here from Kendall. How do you avoid showing where your markup comes from when the financing bank requires a sworn construction statement with lien waivers uh, from suppliers and subs? Um, in our book, Markup and Profit, it shows you how to do that. We've got a section in there on how to take your numbers, break them down, and put them in a form that the banks will accept. My personal feeling is I would, you know, I would tell the homeowner that, you know, now this is personal. If you you know if, if your contractors don't want to do it, that's fine. But I I wouldn't you know if they, the bankers want me to fill out those kind of forms, I'm going to tell the homeowner I'm going to charge them for them. Either that or the homeowner can do it, or I'm not going to do it all and walk away, depending. But you don't you don't let the banks tell you how to run your business. Remember that, okay? But if if you right. want to do business with them, then there is a uh, I forget what page it's on, but it's in the um, it's in this book book right here, Markup and Profit, and there's a system in there on how you can um, readjust your numbers so that it's acceptable to the bank. It, that Perfect. comes under the, it's under um, insurance work, I believe is where it is, but it works for the banks as well. And then a, a quick one from Brooke is a roofing contractor in the skilled trade, or are we talking remodel? Roofing contractor? Yes. That's a specialty contractor. Okay. Okay. But now, here's the thing on roofing. Roofing contractors will have a higher markup item for item than electrical contractor because your risks are going to be a lot higher. Okay. 
and you know you're going to be up on roof working and in adverse conditions much more so than an electrical or a plumbing contractor although every every trade has a uh, you know some problems but but roofing contractors you're going to have higher insurance rates so your markup is going to be higher okay but uh, if you're doing remodeling, that would mean that, to me, uh, that's two trades or more. So if you're doing roofing and you find rot and you've got to do demolition and you've got to tear the sheeting off and maybe you've got some uh, stick frame trusses and, you know, not the, not the manufactured trusses, but stick frame trusses, you have to, you know, cut out some cords and stuff like that and they're rotten and, and maybe even go down and re-insulate. Now you're in three or four trades right there. Now you become a remodeling contractor. But generally speaking, roofing contractors are, you know, they just stick to one thing and they, and they, and their markup. Uh, I, you know, if I were in the roofing business, I would not use a markup of less than 1.4 times my cost. And I have a number of roofing contractors that I that I coach, and and all of them are at, in fact a couple of them are at one point five. Okay. Um, we've got a couple here. Just a couple of our folks in California saying they can only collect a thousand dollars for their retainer. I said that. Yeah, yeah. So so Michael touched on that, and I've also heard some things like. You know, you can only collect five hundred dollars a day in California. I don't know if there's some interesting nope. laws nope. going on. No, and that would have to be a local law. It's not a state law. I've got okay. the, I've got the state laws for California right on my computer. Um, that might be without the contractor license uh, for more handyman. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's what that is. It's it's the the small jobs. So they can only go up to five hundred dollars, or not any more than that. Okay. And then one here, are there other ways to calculate your markup without good historical numbers to work off of? Yeah, I, I just covered that. You figure out what you want to take out of the company and just work it backwards from there. Right. And that's what we talked about when we were looking at the one to four years divided by 8%. Yes. Is that yes. right? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So that should answer your question there, John. Uh, let's see here. We've only got a couple minutes left. While we're waiting, you know, I want to caution everybody that, you know, it's real easy to get all hung up in this price thing because everybody else in town, oh, I get the lowest bid and, you know, customers are always talking about prices and, and things like that. And you can't buy into that pricing thing. You've got to figure out what your job costs are, which is done by good estimating and job costing, by the way. You need the good job costing so you know your estimating databases are correct. And then when your when your estimates are correct, you've got to come up with you know what it costs you to run your business, what your profit you want to make, and that should be no less than eight percent. And if you put those numbers together and say this is my price, you know what's interesting when I take on coaching clients, most of them come to me with a markup of one point one five to one point two, and within thirty days I have their markup at one point five, and guess what? They're selling more work to the same crowd. Because people start realizing that you know, when they're too cheap, there's something wrong. So they're not afraid to pay a little bit more money and get a good contractor. And that's what the higher price represents is a better contractor. So, you know, try it. You'll like it. <laughs> so here's <laughs> a, <laughs> yeah, so here's a good one from Bob. So he works with an architect who uh, wants the estimate broken down very specifically, basically for the intent to be scrutinized by the architect and the mm -hmm. client. Mm -hmm. And then compared to other builders, uh, he wants to know your thoughts on that. Why well, get involved with those people? I, I, you know, there's no nice way to say it. I would, I just tell them, hey, I'm giving you lump sum price for the job. If you want that, fine. If you don't, then call somebody else. Because I'll get you. I'll guarantee you that when he's giving prices out to this guy, I doubt he's getting one in three. And that should be your minimum from any architect you work with. If you're not getting one in three, just tell them, hey, you know, I'm not your numbers guy. You want that, you go hire somebody else, or you're paying me for it. And your time should be worth at least 150 bucks an hour to provide estimates or prices and stuff like that to these architects. These architects think that's all you've got to do is drive around and give out numbers. That's not why you're in business. You're in business to provide a service and make a profit doing it. And if anybody tries to de derail that, then walk away from them. Right. Okay. Uh, we've got one here from Mark Brandon, uh, who's actually been a customer of ours for, for quite a while. He's wondering if the recent trend in transparency um, has been a bad idea. You know, what are your thoughts on giving itemized estimates with itemized pricing? Why would you do that? 
See, this is the thing I don't understand. I have written, and, and you know where most of this, this, this transparency crap comes from? Is promoted by the editors of some of these trade magazines we have. Remodeling magazine, professional remodeler, professional builder, home builder, all those magazines, all that stuff comes from the editors. They want to promote this transparency thing. What they're trying to do is take care of the home or building owner out there instead of taking care of the contractors. And I have written articles of that like on professional remodeling. Magazine. We wrote an article about that. Don't get involved in transparency because the only thing that's going to be transparent uh, is your way out of business. Okay. It's none of their business what your proprietary numbers are. If they want itemized things, let them go down to Home Depot or Lowe's themselves and do all the time. You spent years learning this stuff. Why should you give it away? That's just nonsense. This idea that, well, I've got to have transparency. If you want transparency, then get out of, get out of a box of uh, a quick seal, you know, that you use for covering pots after dinner at night. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a very <laughs> transparent thing I can think of. My numbers, as far as my overhead and profit, are none, nobody else's business. And if they want to look at my estimate sheet, they should pay me for it. I had to work to put that estimate together. Why should I give that away? Architects so, don't give their work away, okay? These right. magazine editors don't go work on their magazines for no charge. And who's to say I should give all my work away? Who's, who says I? Contractors get walked on all the time, and I say, don't do that. If they want you to work, and that's when you're providing information to them, you're working. I don't care how you twist it, you're working. Get paid for it. If they don't want to pay it, walk away. That's not your type of business. Right. Good, good customers will pay you because they know that they want the job done right. They're going to have to pay a fair price for it. Good customers, that's what you're after. Okay. And that kind of leads into another question here asked by Matt uh, that I think everyone can relate to is, should you charge for the estimate or should you charge for the agreements that come after the estimate? Well, if you're using a design agreement like we talk about in, um, hang on a second, we've got a, a book I wrote here, Profitable Sales of Contractors Guide. We talk in there, a hub of, you need to be working off a design agreement where you go out and you ask the four basic questions from the owner and find out, you know, what they, what, what they want to do, when they want to do it, who's going to make the buying decision, and what's their budget for the job. You get those things set, and you say, here's how we work. And then you move into a design agreement where you're getting paid to, number one, do the design, then draw the plans, then do the estimate, and then write all the paperwork and bring it back to the customer and say, here's what we're going to do for you. All right, I'm going to give you a day or two to review it. All right, now I'm going to come back and sit down. We're going to go through the whole thing. If it's good, you're going to sign it. You're going to get me a check for our down payment, and we're Tomorrow morning, we're off uh, getting materials ordered and getting off and get the permits done. That way, you're getting paid for the estimate, which is a much better way of doing it than going to telling a customer, well, I'm going to charge you $150 to come out and look at your job, and, and I'll give you an estimate on it. Uh, that's going to turn off an awful lot of people because, the, you know, our buying public is, uh, you know, they think that contractors are uh, will work for nothing, and, and a lot of the flaky ones will. And so the answer is not a charging for an estimate. It's developing a design agreement that the customer is ready to sign on to and get involved in. And of course your design agreement will run anywhere from four to eight percent of the sales price of the job. And so this these things are, are are covered in both of our books and there's a number of articles and stuff on the internet that you can read. But a design agreement's a proper way to go. Perfect. And Michael, we won't eat too much more of your time. So oh, we'll just do one more question here. Sure. Um, yes, we've got one from John who does, uh, he, he does new builds, specialty and remodel. So he wants to know, should he use a different markup or the same? We talked about obviously the three different markups for yes. new home, specialty yes. and remodeling, but should yes. he use a different one or should he blend it all into one? No, you need to keep each, each division you do, new home construction, remodeling, specialty work, um, number one, I would question why you would do that because it's too much of a distraction. You need to focus on one thing. That's where you're going to start making money. But aside from that, if you do do new home construction and remodeling, you need two separate markups. That way you can keep, um, you, you keep all your numbers separate and you know exactly where you're at. New home construction is less expensive to do than remodeling. And one of the primary reasons is that your time as a remodeling contractor will be four to five times as much for a given job than somebody building a new home for another for another person. 
Okay, so your your cost right there alone is going to be much higher because you have more of your time involved with your customer. For every hour you spend with a new home uh, buyer, you're going to spend four to five hours with a remodeling buyer. Great. And this is one of the reasons that I talk about in the Markup and Profit book that contractors should not try to do new home construction remodeling because very few of them have the discipline or the system set up where they can keep their numbers completely different. As an example, if they're building a remodel job over in this part of the town and right next door they're building a new home, they'll go to the lumber yard and pick up a load and there's no way they're going to distinguish a difference between the two. Thereby, they're not going to be able to come up with the exact cost of each of those two jobs. They lump them together and they never know where they're at. And that's why you can't do that. It takes a lot of discipline to keep remodeling and new home construction separate. But if you do it, you know exactly where you're at and you know if you're making money or not. Right. Yeah, just one more quick one here from Carrie. Um, so she's saying that for your remodeling bid, should you just give a total price, no detail of any kind? Should we still have the, you know, the items on the estimate, obviously, but you know, no individual pricing? We, we talked about this a few minutes ago. Yep. I, I wouldn't give in to the pricing. If you're okay. doing it, if you do a design build agreement, when you come back with your proposal, it lists everything you're going to do and your price on there for the work you're going to do and your allowance amounts, that kind of stuff. But I wouldn't go into any more detail than that. You know? Yeah. Just stop, definitely. Stop, and th stop and think about this. I've been in this business now. I started estimating jobs in 1954 with my father. Okay, now that's a little older than most of the people on listening have been alive. During that period of time, I found less than five people that could read my estimate sheet when I completed it that were not in construction, less than five. All right, so they want itemization. That says to me, oh, they know what they're looking at, and that's baloney. 999 out of 1,000 people could not read my estimate sheet or know if I gave them a a, a, a breakdown of my job, but transparency as they call it, they have no idea what they're looking at. Absolutely none. Okay? So, right. stop and think about it. They don't know what we're doing. If they knew, here's the thing, if the customer knew and could read your estimate sheet, they wouldn't need you. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't. They could do it themselves. Well, awesome. Yeah, this is, uh, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up here. We'll let you go, Michael. But um, this has been a fantastic turnout, fantastic presentation. We had over 200 contractors join us today, which was Good. awesome. Um, a lot of questions in here about your products, Michael. So mm -hmm. all of that can be found at overheadandprofit.com. Um, and just did you want to speak a little on that? Oh, uh, hang on. Go right to our website, and you can find everything on our website that you want. Okay. Perfect. Market yeah, and then profit. Clear Estimates is also going to send out just uh, you know a quick um, you know blog post about what happened today, what we talked about. It will also include a couple links to uh, what Michael referenced a few times, which was his book, Markup and Profit Contractor's Guide. He's also got a markup calculator on his website, um, and then various classes. They do training, coaching, consulting. Uh, so we'll get um, we'll get that information out to you as well. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Michael. This has you been bet. a fantastic presentation. We really do appreciate you coming out. Um, you know, we we couldn't be happier with with the presentation here. Okay, gang, go sell some. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, you Devin. Yeah, this has been fantastic. And we'll see you guys for the next one, which is April 9th. We're going to be talking with Karen Mitchell, who Michael also knows and has worked with about uh, some accounting best practices just in time for tax season, which we're all very excited about. Well, thanks again, everyone. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and end the webinar here. Okay. Bye-bye.